All right, so you can see I have an, a basically empty Photoshop file. Opens just a black background with some white writing on it. The writing is um, a description from the client that I copied and pasted in there. And it just has basic outline of what the background should look like. And right now I'm looking for reference images, obviously had a lot more of that, but I cut it all out because ever, everyone knows how to search for an image online. All right, I've got Blender open now. Just getting the basic shape of the hall done first. And then I didn't use a reference image for that. I had a basic picture in my mind of the composition. Um, I've got a human in there for height reference so that I can you know, make sure the doors and all that are the correct height relative to um, a person and basically whenever I add a new thing into the scene I put the person next to it to see, you know, if it looks roughly right. It's just easier because you can obviously um, add in new scenes, add in um, new objects rather and measure them, you know, relative to each other, but, I don't know, it's, I just find it easier using a human, because you, when you look at it like a table and chairs, you don't think to yourself, oh, well that, you know, chair is, I don't know, the seat is half as high as the table top, or something like that, you don't really think of it like that, you think of things in relation to how high they are with you or with other people. Um, I'm not sure whether I should explain exactly what I'm doing here. It's kind of hard to explain if you're not familiar with 3D modeling, but I'm basically adding in some loop cuts, or a lot of loop, loop cuts actually. Um, and it's a very easy way to model like this. Um, even though it might look confusing if you're not familiar with it. But even it, it might look a bit wasteful, like adding all these faces in, even though I'm not going to use some of them, but it comes in very handy later. It's, it is quite hard to explain, actually. <laughs> That's the, um, the sun rays that um, cone thing going over the entire scene um, and that's what caused I actually rendered those rays coming in I didn't paint them in in Photoshop later There's Skype flashing at the top there <laughs> I'm just adding the windows in now um, that's an array modifier I've just added um, it basically copies the model you've just made and repeats it um, as many times as you want along a given axis. Um, it's very, very useful. There's also another one which I'll use later called the mirror modifier and you basically chop and chop any object in half and it'll you can mirror it and that way you only have to model half the half the mesh and it'll reflect the rest and using that in combination with an array modifier means you know you can have like a load of stuff on screen like hundreds and hundreds of objects on screen and you only have to edit half of one it's very convenient here I'm adding all my reference images that I collected into the file it's just sort of like a very boring Tetris You'll see later, yeah, I resize that. I actually move it over further because it, the image is just repeating. It's, you know, you only need to see about perhaps four of those red lockers. See how they repeat horizontally and vertically, and then you don't really need to see the rest of the image because it's exactly the same. And then I bring that image into Blender and that way I don't need to switch between 
you know, an image viewer or Photoshop or whatever. I only have to work in the one program. Uh, don't know what to say here. I'm just <laughs> modeling more. Um, in the top right um, window in Blender, you can see I've got these nodes set up. Um, it's very zoomed out. That's the compositor. And um, you can mix together, basically, mix together different render layers and add effects and so on. I didn't really do anything fancy with this scene. I think I just layered, I put on, um, put on uh, some things on a different layer, like the sun rays, for example, they're on a different layer and the sky is on a different layer. That way if I don't like the color of the sky or I want to put something outside, um, that's the first render that I sent to the client. Um, yeah, if I want to tone down the sun rays or the sky or whatever, I can. It's not a flat render that I have to, you know, just deal with once it's rendered because sometimes a render will take like an hour, an hour or something perhaps. I don't know. Mine usually don't take much longer than an hour, but they can take, you know, up to 10 hours if you, if you don't really plan what you're doing well if, or if you're rendering something very, very, very detailed. But generally, if you think it through before you render it, you can reduce your render time quite a bit by taking shortcuts. Just not having really high samples set when you render sometimes and just editing things in Photoshop later can save you time. You know, there's no point rendering something that can be done in Photoshop in five minutes. Here I'm modeling the lockers and you'll see me use the mirror modifier in a second here. Cut it in half. Right now I've got the array modifier on. And you can see the array adjusts, it pos adjusts its position based on the shape, or rather the size of the model. When it's set to relative offset anyway. You can see that from the reference images that I saved, I didn't end up using very many, very many, very much of them. Um, I mostly used the one in the bottom center, but it's always good to have a lot of reference images to draw draw on, because then if you get stuck partway through, you're not, you know, switching back to your web browser to you know, find an image to reference, or, you know, spending time designing something from your imagination. Um, here, here I'm beveling the edges of the lockers. I do that with a lot of objects that I make, particularly for, um, particularly for when the art's intended for like an anime style game because I don't know, a lot of 3D art you see used for visual novels looks kind of crap, honestly. Um, <laughs> it looks very 3D, it looks very sterile and part of that is the, you know, super straight, super sharp edges and beveling that is one of the things you can do to, you know, kind of alleviate that really sterile look. And another thing that I just did just then was rotate the notice board a little. I actually undid it because I was, forgot that I needed to edit it a bit, but once I'm finished, I'll tilt it again. Just little things like that, making it so everything isn't really perfect. Because, firstly, in the real world, nothing is perfectly aligned. Everything, you know, isn't perfectly straight and there's that. But also when 
artists go to make something, when they're painting something, you know, their lines aren't perfectly parallel. The lines aren't perfectly converging to the vanishing point. And you have to keep that in mind when you're making 3D because, you know, when you extrude something or scale something or whatever, um, in 3D, the computer's, you know, manipulating these vertices and faces and edges and whatnot perfectly. Like, everything is perfectly aligned. Everything is, you know, you can snap things to an axis and it'll move perfectly along that axis. Well, when artists make, you know, when they paint things and stuff, they're, they're not doing that. They're generally not going to be using rulers or whatever. Most of them are just going to be... Um, you know, they clean up their artwork afterwards, but it's still not perfectly straight, and it still looks good, of course, but you have to keep that in mind, like, it's the little imperfections which make it look, you know, like art. And that's not true of every single style, but for most styles, you you can see you know, traces of an actual artist, you know, drawing it or whatever. And with good 3D, it's the same. It looks, you know, indistinguishable almost, unless you're deliberately going for a look, unless you're not trying to, you know, replicate a hand-drawn look. Actually, on that subject, there's a lot of different things you can do to help make your 3D look more hand-drawn. Beveling is one. Another thing is, you know, making sure everything isn't perfectly aligned. Um, another is to do with the materials you use. Um, if you look at anime um, backgrounds, they're not... You know, the level of detail usually isn't really far beyond the actual characters that are depicted in the scene. Usually they're a bit more detailed than the characters in terms of like, um, they're more textured, if that makes sense. If you look at the ground, it's not, you know, a flat colour, whereas um, in some anime anyway, like, you'll look at a character and they'll just have like a flat colour on them. They're cell shaded, in other words. Backgrounds usually aren't s like cell shaded in the same way that um, the characters are. And um, the point I'm getting to eventually is that the backgrounds aren't that detailed, so you shouldn't be putting like super sharp wood grain textures in or, the, you know, gravel textures or whatever that are just photos off the internet that, you know, just have a really high level of detail. I mean, the cameras take photos. I don't even know what resolution they take photos at now. My camera's really old and, you know, it takes 3,000 by 2,000 pixel images and, you know, that's really detailed especially if you're aiming it at the ground or something close up and using that as a texture. You can't use that in, like, an anime-styled background and expect it to look good. It'll just look crap. So you need to process it a bit. Usually I just um, use procedural textures, which um, a, a good example would be the clouds in Photoshop. That's a procedural texture. It's just... Um, you know, a bit of code used to generate an image. Um, sometimes I use uh, photos or whatever, but I usually blur them or something, or um, you use one of the artistic filters in Photoshop. Um, I tend not to rely too heavily on one of those filters because Anyone with a little bit of experience with them will recognize them right away. If you, you know, blur the crap out of something, it'll just look like a blurred... I don't even know what. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
you know, the point is don't get too detailed with the textures. So that's one thing you can do. Um, another thing is that um, a lot of 3D art for visual novels and so on doesn't have any sort of post-processing. So in Blender there's the compositor, you can use that, but you know, you can just bring it into Photoshop or GIMP or whatever image editor you want to use. Um, and then there's just some basic stuff you can do to make the image look a lot better than a raw render. Because a lot of the lighting in renders looks it contributes to the sterile look. It's... I don't even know how to articulate it. Um, <laughs> but the way you can fix it is by going to Photoshop and adding in, you know, a gradient or just, you know, getting the paint bucket and dumping some color on another layer and then setting it to overlay or color or saturation or whatever, actually probably not saturation, but um, something like that, and then reducing the opacity quite a bit, and just having that sitting on, you know, 5% opacity um, will help unify the image in terms of color. Um, it'll make it look like everything in the scene belongs in the scene, if that makes sense. It all exists in the same world. Um, another thing is for outdoor renders in particular, a lot of people, a lot of people, um, set up a sun lamp, um, a lamp is what it's called in Blender, the light, um, and they'll render the scene and the sun will be colored slightly, you know, they'll choose a color that's slightly off-white, usually slightly yellow and white, and that's it. That doesn't look right. Um, on a on a bright sunny day, because on a sunny day the the sun is sure it's shining on the ground and perhaps it a slightly yellow tinge would look cool, but the sky is also reflecting the light, and if you look carefully at anything not getting direct sunlight, you'll notice that it's getting slight blue light from the sky. All right, my recording software keeps dying, which is really, really annoying. I've totally lost my train of thought. Um, I think I was talking about um, making backgrounds not look really sterile. I said um, beveling helps, not having things, you know, strictly aligned to some sort of grid helps. Um, and then I cannot even remember what I said. Here's another render that I sent to the client. This is me making a texture. Pretty self-explanatory, wasn't particularly detailed texture. As you can see from the reference image on the left, I took quite a bit of um, inspiration from that for my own um, hall design. The writing on the left of the image saying science, um, I added that on my own saying labs um, and the bottom half of the wall being a different color. So even though I saved that for the lockers originally I ended up using it as a reference image for something else. And you know I, I mix together a lot of different reference images. I don't just you know grab one and then go with that and model 
and try to recreate a particular photo, I already have the image in my head before I start, or if I don't have it in my head um, and I'm unsure or it's a complex scene or whatever, I'll get out a piece of paper, divide it into um, six different sections, an A4 piece of paper, and then, you know, draw out some concept sketches for myself. I'm not a particularly good drawer or anything, but it just helps to have it on paper. Alright, I'm going to switch to real time here.